Very rarely in a trope-driven Hallmark Christmas movie do we escape the stressful corporate humdrum of the big city to a tropical wonderland on board an Art Deco ocean liner still in service somehow with all the rich wood veneer that somehow got past the renewed 2010 soulless regulations intact, might I add. Usually the goal is quite the opposite, to trap the ambitious girl boss main character in a cozy, small, snow-blanketed town reminiscent of places like Murder, She Wrote's Cabot Cove, except without all the murder and cheeky gossip, or Gilmore Girls stars Hollow, except without the controversial subject matters and archetyped community members. Also, she can slow down, meet a hunky, manly man's man, and embrace the little things in life. Or something. But, you know what? The 2017 made-for-streaming-slash-TV movie A Christmas Cruise was not made by Hallmark. It's not like other Christmas movies. And I say that unironically. For the most part. It changes things up a bit in a way that viewers can appreciate. For the most part. Why hello and ho 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 y'all, or should I say dude bruh? Because we're in the smoggy, sun-drenched, semi-tropical desert, Southern California coast uh, this Christmas. My name is Matthew and I tried. I tried to learn how to tie a bow tie, but this is as good as it's going to get, Bill Nye. It is rocket science after all. And how poetically thematic to the seagoing movie we're reviewing today because my issues don't get worked out nearly as quickly or conveniently as the characters in these types of movies. Welcome to Great Chips of Cinema, a series on my channel where I talk about all different forms of media throughout time that feature the great dames of the high seas. Also, we can vicariously gain further insight into the shipboard life while critiquing how well shipboard life was featured and what it says about the time period, bringing us just a little bit closer to the otherwise distant and supposedly unrelatable past. In some cases. This is definitely <laughs> not quite completely one of them, although can we all agree that 2017 was a very different time? And appropriately enough, today is a lighthearted, for the most part, look at a movie that dares take the Christmas trope out to sea. Something rarely done that I commend the makers of the movie for. For the most part. We're gonna get into all of that. According to IMDb, A Christmas Cruise was first released on December 16th, 2017, and later, according to Rotten Tomatoes, on December 7th, 2018, an entire year later. Maybe one was for TV and the other one was for streaming, unless countries are being mixed up here. I really do feel like it shouldn't be very hard to find things out about this movie, but maybe it was that quickly rushed together alongside its sibling film The Wrong Cruise, released a year later in July of 2018 and premiered on Lifetime. They use so many of the same shots, I wouldn't doubt they saved time and money by filming them simultaneously. Very different movies, however. They're both, unsurprisingly enough, directed and produced by David Decouteau and the star actor Vivica A. Fox. Decouteau has been involved in all kinds of B-movies, most of them in the horror genre, also known as shock cinema. Interesting turn of the tide, so to speak, to suddenly decide to make an arguably heartwarming Christmas movie. And thirsty too, may I add, but we're gonna get into that. This movie was produced and or released by Mulholland Productions. They've been around for quite a long time, closely associated with Baltimore, TriStar, and Sony Pictures. They're behind the likes of films like Bugsy and Dick Tracy back in the early 90s, but there seem to be only eight movies that they've ever helped produce or distribute, so no wonder I couldn't find a whole lot about them. For whatever it's worth, let's start out by taking a look at the cover art. Hmm, great composition. What are those? Titanic smokestacks in the background, all in front of the massive Lido deck? That's an awkward looking ship. I wonder what they're all looking at, by the way. This one is a lot better than the alternative poster art we get, especially considering that that guy plays a supporting role, I'm pretty sure. 
Anyway, you think this was a Hallmark movie the way it opens? Stock footage of the Big Apple with a stock Christmas song and stock narration. Speaking of the narration, it's pretty basic, but well written and well said by Vivica A. Fox herself, who plays, you guessed it, the ambitious businesswoman who just can't escape work for a moment, nor seems to want to. Pam Stevenson is her name this time, and this time, she's a journalist. Vivica A. Fox was a big deal in the 90s into the early thousands, co-starring in such hugely successful films like the 1996 Independence Day and the 2003 Kill Bill Volume 1. She made an incredible transition going from the mainstream spotlight to this more B-roll genre. She's an actress, she's a producer, a TV host, author, entrepreneur, philanthropist. She's very popular and has some fans who follow her no matter what she does and more power to her. Ooh, possibly to our benefit, this movie is speeding along. We quickly get quite the juxtaposition between the concrete jungle, big city, cubicle life, and wholesome small townish life represented in this very large mansion house estate. Just like how far away Retha Gray, who plays Vivek A. Fox's mom in this movie, is from the main staircase. That foyer is bigger than my apartment. It's a fun issue presented to us. Ham versus turkey, tradition versus newness? Is that what they're going for there? Am I looking too deeply into it already? And later, we get the best of both worlds. Why not have ham and turkey? <laughs> We also learn through subtle exposition that Pam is writing a book. <gasps> That's definitely gonna play a big part later, kind of, sort of, we'll go into that. This is quickly followed up by two co-workers hyped up on caffeine and sugar and maybe something else. And I really don't blame Pam's determination here. Whatever's going on on that blank screen must be important. And just as she's making some kind of breakthrough, she gets a text from her Come on, loosen up, girlfriend, token white best friend, way to turn the tables on that one. We learn once they meet through this conversation that Pam is not just an ambitious girl boss after all, but mostly just very overworked. More relatable than some of the Hallmark movies out there, in my opinion. This is New York, so it makes sense that she lives in an apartment and struggles to pay rent. And here is the inciting incident. Becky is giving Pam the Christmas present of a lifetime. A Christmas cruise? It's a five-day boat trip from San Pedro, the port of Los Angeles. Literally, by the way. Like, way too literally. We'll go into what I mean by that shortly. This tiny little island about 200 miles out in the Pacific, it's a resort called Christmas Island. First literal, an island called Christmas Island? Does it have another name during the other 11 months out of the year? It must, right? Even Pam wants to know. It's really called Christmas Island. Yeah, it's a themed resort. Oh, let me guess the theme. Pirates? <laughs> <laughs> Hear me out. The cruise leaves in two days. We'll just fly out to LA, go on the cruise, and I'll have you back by next week. Two days? Two days? What kind of notice does a job like what she's got allow in two days time? Because that was super easy, barely an inconvenience, wasn't it? She really must have been tallying up those sick days. Also, gotta give credit to the set design and the bokeh here. <laughs> That's right, who paid $35,000 for a film degree? <laughs> she enters into her very beautiful apartment. That woodwork looks a century old. Very dark and moody. The movie starts off strong. The color grading starts getting wonky later, though, and so does a few other things, which we'll get into. You better believe it. Work remainder? Is that a thing? Through the follow-up conversation with her mom that tackles the whole turkey versus ham debacle, we see that she questions whether she likes her overworked job position or not. A million girls would kill for it kind of a situation, sort of. I don't know, it's not fleshed out very well. We'll get into that later as well. Also, her coworker. How condescending. Boss wants to see you. Okay. Hey, he said now. Never gotta get ahead. Mm. Want a reindeer cupcake? I live a little. That or this scene isn't executed very well at all. Did you not hear her? She's never going to get ahead. She can't help it, bruh. Why don't you give her some slack? You're the bad guy in this situation. 
It's like you, the, the millennial thing has just been done to death. Okay, as a millennial, I do really appreciate that. This is one thing that sets this movie apart from The Wrong Cruise and a few other Hallmark movies out there. It's put together a lot better. It's a little smoother and better paced. The dialogue and acting has some thoughtfulness put into it, and they're clearly having fun with it. Having a seasoned pro like Fox helps with this a lot. They're just vibing, okay? This is coming from someone who hasn't seen a lot of these kinds of movies, so maybe it's a little fresher for me, but I really do feel like it's a little more extra in some ways than your typical cheap Hallmark ant-farmed melodrama. There's a lot of good dialogue here. Gotta be one of my favorite scenes, and considering it keeps getting lazier later on, that doesn't say much, I suppose. And unlike a lot of these movies, they fill in this plot hole, as far as I'm concerned, to be it a plot convenience, where this two-day job notice becomes an assignment. Yeah, a little too convenient now that I think about it, but the set design and color grading is so appetizing it kind of makes up for it, doesn't it? Again, probably typical of the genre, but I gotta give it some credit. And at the 1220 mark, we go from the appetizing Christmas ambiance to what I consider this very dry, smoggy, stressful Los Angeles ambiance. I don't know. I'm saying this as a native, by the way, so maybe no wonder it's having the opposite effect on me than it should the audience. We get the exact same shot from The Wrong Cruise of our beloved Dame of the High Seas that at the time so desperately needed a paint job amongst many other things. I'm talking about the legendary 1930s Art Deco masterpiece, The Queen Mary. With the rocks still surrounding it, how's the ship gonna get out of the harbor? I find this strange because they fix this in the wrong cruise by matting over everything with an ocean filter. It really did make such a huge difference too and really goes to show the impact that sad but sadly necessary breakwater serves. We get to see the interior of the ship in this movie, so I'm happy that it's more than just stock footage of a random ship that they needed. But they couldn't mat out the rocks? I don't know, they matted out the Queen Mary sign with the Christmas Queen. So were they in a real rush or something? And unlike The Wrong Cruise, where they just took away the name completely, at least they replaced it with Christmas Queen. Here's the next part of the literal that I touched on earlier. Like, that name is welded onto the side of the ship. How does this cruise line work, anyways? Is it like North Pole, Alaska, where it's Christmas year-round? This universe must be obsessed with Christmas. Ship's registry costs time and money, baby. You know they're not changing that name twice a year every single year. Also, we see either the carnival imagination or inspiration in the background, which is missing in the establishing aerial shot. It's a cheap seasonal movie. They don't care. Not worth the trouble, I guess, right? But worth pointing out. Both the imagination and inspiration got scrapped in Aliaga, Turkey in the midst of the 2020 pandemic. Remember that eerie, iconic shot of the three fantasy class carnival ships and two Royal Caribbean sovereign class ships that became a huge representation of the state of the world? To learn more, check out my series on the Sovereign Class ships and the Carnival Class Fantasy Class ships to learn more about their origins and why they got scrapped and the whole story behind all that. Plug in, always plug in. Just look at how sad the Christmas Queen's hull is. I'm pretty sure she hadn't been painted since 1971 at this point, when she first opened to the public, by the way. But wow, we actually see some scaffolding coming up in this very shot. So I suspect they are just beginning to start the process of the glistening paint job retained beautifully for the most part today. Strangely, we see it toward the end of the cruise portion of the wrong cruise. You see this, and in the last shot, the ship is painted. This tells me it wasn't all done in one day for some reason. You also see part of the white tarp over the third funnel when they were starting to repaint the funnels that controversial canard red. People, if you don't want to see them faded by the sun in a matter of months, I'm good with the Aquitania look. Let's represent the four stackers that came before her. 
Also, this is clearly Long Beach and not San Pedro, Becky. From San Pedro, the port of Los Angeles. Wow, Miss can't even pronounce the name correctly? Someone just wants to get away and not deal with semantics, I guess. Maybe in this universe, this is San Pedro and it is pronounced San Pedro? Here we learn that this is Pam's first cruise ever. Woo! Are the waves gonna be choppy? The ship's so big you won't even feel the waves. Good. Like, I hate to disappoint you, Becky baby, but the Queen Mary was known for rolling in her day. <sighs> Unless the ship we're seeing here is actually this, or this, or this, or this ship we see later on. This really is the Twilight Zone we're in. Do they notice the ship keeps changing all the time, or are they in the Matrix without realizing it? The writers and producers are way deeper than we think they are. Terrence Malick and Mr. Kubrick eat your hearts out. What are you doing? Uh, just uh, writing down a few notes. Pam, we're on vacation. I know. I'm just writing down my first impressions of the boat. Okay, I'm on Pam's side here. I'd want that promotion too, and it was probably the only way she was able to, you know, get off of work in two days' notice. But the very underdeveloped underlying question here is whether Pam wants the promotion herself or not. I just wish this was established earlier on so Becky's intrusive persistence carries more weight. This is super unrealistic. They stopped doing this hand-waving thing in the 70s, and I think the love boat hyped it up for TV even. This is more like the way they did it back in the 30s, and how long do they plan on waving for, by the way? This ship ain't leaving for at least another two hours. The chipping paint on the promenade deck shell is so sad, but somehow juxtaposed next to that are the lifeboats which are glistening. I think we're the only people on this cruise who remember the 90s. <laughs> I don't know what Pam means by this 90s statement. Could she be referring to how she seems to see no one below the age of 40 or something? Because Gen X and Boomers do tend to be the ones who cruise the most, in my experience at least. More so in 2017, though? But I shouldn't guess the reason why she's making that statement. Are you taking the cruise just for the shrimp? He thinks with his stomach. That's not the only thing I think with. <laughs> oh. oh! Bruh, come on, what are you trying to prove? I'm about to become a PDA Karen in this ship. Gotta say though, this gangway interaction isn't too unrealistic. On one cruise I went on all by myself, I tried my best to be a loner. It was me, the ship, and the sea, okay? And this was just as cruising was returning post-pandemic at the end of October 2021 too, by the way. The ship was literally half capacity, and yet I couldn't get away from interacting and even hanging out with some people. It's just the nature of cruising. Introverts beware. You're in for a Okay, what is this ticket taking thing all about? This is a big ship, so even on a heavily themed cruise like this, I doubt there'd be someone announcing what they've already read in their brochures. And what is this, an event? What cruise line has a ticket taker? A ticket checker? By this time, everything was digital and check-in would have already occurred in the cruise terminal. And you know what, this goes for any and every time period for that matter, now that I think about it. Hey, if it gives an actress a paycheck and brings more exposition hype to the movie, <sighs> it's still not worth it. We enter into the Queen Mary's original first class shopping center, just forward of Promenade Deck. After the war, it was coined Piccadilly Circus by troops who crossed aboard her because of how much it reminded them of home, perhaps? Better times, maybe? Did you know they serve all-you-can-eat shrimp here? Okay, why are they trying to play off shrimp as such a funny, quick throwaway line in just this part of the movie, too, by the way? Check out our shrimp bar on the mistletoe deck. There is no real context here. Maybe you have to read between the lines or get the joke. Was this an inside joke among the cast and crew, perhaps? Is it a commentary on how men are always hungry? or how people like me will take full advantage of the seafood option aboard because of how expensive it is on land. Okay, so it's a little more relatable than I thought, I guess. I think I get it. 
That's how badly executed it was for me to have to ask about it though. See what I mean about how this movie starts out strong and just keeps kind of unraveling as it goes along? Hey baby, we're on the love boat now. Oh fiance, you'll be too busy in the buffet mooching off the seafood, you cheap skate! Yeah, major spoiler alert. He has cold feet later on about the marriage, and it comes out of nowhere, by the way. This would have been the perfect opportunity to get the conflict rolling and make us wonder about what's going on between the two. We had a deal. Becky, honey, that's called littering, and the crew doesn't get paid enough to deal with your rich white privilege. If you don't put that up when you're done, I'm throwing it overboard. But it is the perfect plot convenience that leads us to meet with our love interest and cruise director of the story, Jake, played by the late, great Christoph St. John, who had been around the Hollywood industry for a very long time, with a wide variety of movies and television shows in his repertoire, including The Young and the Restless, where he was perhaps most known. He also left us way too soon, dying of a heart attack in 2019, not even that long ago. We see him gliding down the beautiful Art Deco steps of the Queen Mary, where we see the dyed pigskin panels installed post-war to make the ship more relevant to the mid-century modern era. Before she had beautiful wood veneers all over, it was said it did help to lessen sound in the otherwise very echoey space, but I hope one day we'll see the original Art Deco veneer design return. And we have some actually well-paced romantic tension. Who did the editing of this film because we're not just rushing through it? For the most part. It gets a little wonky later and the season actors are owning it. Sorry, I didn't mean to read your journal. Oh, and he's thoughtful, which means his character arc will be minimal at most later on. I have a subscription to the New York Minute. You know, some of my friends are giving noise because, you know, I still I get the hard copies instead of going digital. I'm a child of the 90s, you know. We get it. The 90s were really swole and it's okay to destroy the rainforest for nostalgia's sake. It starts getting a little labored too, like they need to stop this conversation. Hey, could you ask Becky if she'd like to have dinner with me later tonight, baby? Thanks. I don't know what hotel this is, but it looks very much like a modern cruise ship stateroom corridor. So I approve. And that goes the same with the stateroom. <laughs> what an eclectic ship this is. We go from Art Deco to Economic Hotel in a matter of decks. Oh yeah, and I don't recall seeing the Mary with any balcony cabins. They were probably hidden in plain sight. Speaking of balconies, the scene does the job it's supposed to, I guess. Okay, we're gonna have a different ship counter. Number two. This is either the Disney Magic or Wonder, but most likely the Wonder. I'll explain that later. Sympathetic to the Queen Mary, as they were built to resemble classic ocean liners of the past. I'm not sure if that was intentional or just convenient, though. Speaking of the wrong crews, here we enter the same crew-only area that we have in that movie, where it looks much more ominous, by the way. Convenience aside, it's always cool to see how different storylines depict the same set. That set design for you, I guess. How'd you get into the crew only areas, by the way? Speaking of which, that's what the purser's desk is for. The customer relations, whatever it's called. I guess journalists just got to sleuth, but she's not even doing it for a real purpose. Well, I have a complaint about my bed. It's not comfortable enough. Well, not exactly. It's just that we were supposed to have two beds and there's only one. This is so dumb, like insultingly dumb. I guess when you're paying for a set, you want to get your money's worth. Something just tells me that the wrong cruise was the priority here and they use this set for a Christmas cruise as an afterthought because they're paying for it anyways. <laughs> pauses as he's putting his shirt on. Look, I've never been in a crew member's only area, okay? Well, that's not true. But is it common to just change your shirt and change your outfit in a laundry room or just anywhere you happen to be? Are you even allowed in there as the cruise director? What was your business in there? It wouldn't help to know. And were you off duty before and that's why you didn't wear your uniform? How does shipboard life work again? It's our cabin. Stateroom. Okay. 
You don't correct anyone on calling the ship a boat, but you'll correct her on calling a cabin a stateroom when I've heard it used interchangeably all the time. Who wrote this again? You, you still call it a bed, or do you call them something differently on the boat? The ship. Okay. Never mind. Kind of, I guess. Also, again, credit where it's due, these season actors are doing a good job, and the script is even pretty fire for the genre it's in. For scenes like this, at least. You come back to your stateroom later, and it's done! It's that easy! Why did they make this such a huge conflict? This situation is so stupid! I just feel like they could have made a more relatable problem she's trying to solve for this, you know, connection that they're trying to make happen. Next we have what is clearly a cheap hotel conference room, or some community center, or banquet hall. We're further introduced to the fiancé couple who I think are acting as the foil to Vivica's loner character, maybe? I don't know. Sexy Santa. He's literally called Sexy Santa in the cast list. That's efficient. And thematic. No then good girls and boys this year. Skip! And it's time for presents! Wait, how many cruisers are aboard and how are they funding this? Also, what kind of line is this? Did cruisers pay extra for this? Is this a secret Santa thing? I have way too many questions than this movie warrants. Also, I guess our main cast of characters are the only ones selectively chosen. What is going on here? And we have transition cruise counter number three. This is a grand class Pacific cruise ship and very clearly stock footage. Dang, we are already at cruise counter number four. This is one of the newer Disney ships, the Disney Dream, which debuted in 2010. Dang, was it that long ago? Or the Disney Fantasy debuted in 2012. So they've both been around for quite a while, quite a few years by the time this movie came out. And we return to the same drab Banquet Hall Community Center place. Nice doors, but they're clearly not on a cruise ship. Take me out of the immersion, why don't you? Just look at that fire alarm. I just realized I'm actually on land after all. Okay, so Becky is trying to get Pam to find a man, but Becky winds up finding the famous, in the modeling world at least, Rib Hillis. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing his name right. Though he has had his share of B-movies as well, including The Wrong Man, alongside Vivica A. Fox, where he plays the wrong man. We then transition to one of several absolutely beautiful shots, partly thanks to the Queen Mary's old-timey kind of stacked deck arrangements, double-tiered railings we just don't see anymore, and of course the pre-air-conditioned air vents closely associated with these ships and used often in set designs, even though it's a feature on ships not really seen anymore. After seeing the wrong cruise though, I'm just so ready for one of these crew members to be in some big illegal something and ready to kidnap Pam and Becky at any moment. In this scene, the cruise director is talking to Bob. We get to know Jake's character just a little bit more. They're talking about what a rugged individualist he is. Becky flirts with whatever Rib's name is in this movie. Paul. And somehow appropriately named Gil, played by Corin Nemec. He's got a comic relief meets I'm actually genuinely concerned for this guy vibe. Why do we play those with mental issues off as just a joke still? And I'm saying this is someone with Asperger's syndrome, by the way. Somehow Pam gets perfect reception out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Wait, is that a thing? I never bother to pay for that when I'm on a ship because it's just not worth it and too expensive. This better be a short phone call because every second is racking up a huge bill at the end of your gingerbread smelling cruise on a modern classic cruise liner. Even her boss is getting on her about living a little. Is that normal? I do like how they establish that Jake is already up on deck, except that he's been up there a long time. What are his hours? Shouldn't he be manning some event or something? Cruise directors are like the PR of entertainment, okay? They're also the peacemakers of all the passengers aboard, pretty much. And he's making it look like they clock in at 9 and get out at 5. This is the hospitality industry, brother. You're just as bad as the high-paying directors in Grey's Anatomy, as far as I'm concerned. need to do rounds now! 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 Don't do what? Jump. 
Also, the script might have wanted them to be at the edge where the hull plating meets the air and the sea, but practically they just didn't have the time or money for it. So this joke really doesn't land very well. Okay, you're super sassy, and something about Gil leads me to believe he's able to take it. Why don't you have some fun banter with this guy? Ask him how he's doing. What's with all the hyper paranoia, you know? We don't really get any details on him. Because they just kind of toss him aside. Just a cheap comic relief character because mental health is a laughing matter. Okay, at just about 38 minutes in, we get Cruise Counter. Back to number three again, and I can tell for sure that this is specifically the Disney Wonder. So small the name that they didn't bother to cover it. But I see it, and they are finally on Christmas Island, or whatever it's called in the Christmas-obsessed universe. We get a really sad, vague montage sequence, mostly just shopping capitalism. This had to be improvised. Montages are some of the easiest to pull off, I feel like. But maybe their time was very limited. I don't know. And we reach an apex of characters all meeting together. Ooh, I'm kind of interested. I wonder what's gonna happen. Oh, you're all just gonna go your separate ways? Okay, thanks for the build-up anyway. Okay, forgive me older generations, but that is the most boomer Gen X outfit I've ever seen. Yeah, we millennials have our worthy of scrutiny ensembles too that Gen A and B are going to make fun of us for. I just wanted to point it out though all the same. It's not like it's a bad outfit, I guess. So we don't get back to the ship for a little while, but not as long as I was expecting. Jake, the cruise director, is just everywhere Pam is, isn't he? Bra is dressed too casually. Could they not afford a makeshift cruise director's outfit? I can't seem to find the budget for this movie, but something tells me you guys could afford one of those. Come on now. He then takes her to a very special spot. The same special spot we see in the wrong cruise, by the way. Okay, someone's getting kidnapped. The same special spot we see in the wrong cruise. You're a smart, independent journalist who doesn't need fun or no man to complete you. Keep your wits about you. Keep your wits about you. We find out more about Jake's career history. He was an accountant. A divorcee, that's always sad to hear. And we find out more about Pam as well. They're both so similar, aren't they? And yet so incredibly different. How many women have you brought to this spot? Honestly, um, one. Oh. Counting today. <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't believe him either. This is the cruise industry. Also, she's a passenger? You could get fired for this, you know. I see why he took her to a secluded spot now. Still, don't get on a boat with him and drink the expensive champagne he offers, okay? I don't care how expensive it is. Oh my goodness. I was, I was trying to find reception and this, this thing goes swoop down out of nowhere. And it flew well, away Gil phone. was my favorite oh my character. Come on. You guys were doing so well with him, except the whole being insensitive to mental problems part. This is more than just someone complaining a lot, okay? Like, give this guy some slack. He's clearly been through a lot again, and it's clearly been more than just paranoia. What do you mean, and then what? And then what are you gonna do with the rest of your life? And by the way, it appears Jake has her all figured out all of a sudden. Calm down, Jake, you got your own problems. You are the last person to be lecturing somebody else about long-term goals. Yes, tell him, Pam. This is a great view. Yeah, it sure <laughs> is. Yeah. Speaking of shit. What? Dang it. Still no signal. Ooh, what ooh, is that? Ooh, what is, is ooh. that? We got a signal, right? Yeah. Okay. L-O-L-Z. This selfie thing is really cringe, okay? Even for its time. Was this still a thing in 2017, by the way? Or were they late? It was a different time. It was a very different time, clearly. Is that supposed to be him working? Because without a uniform, I can't tell whether he's pulling a Love Boat Grey's Anatomy thing or not. Y'all need to get out of here. Okay, these kinds of things always annoy me about even mainstream movies. 
you know she is not reaching all the way over there every 40 seconds to 1 minute 10 to sip that coffee. But I guess I can say the same for my setup. So, I get it. Inconvenience is temporary, film is forever. There is a certain inescapable old-fashioned charm to Christmas Island. At every turn, the streets are festooned with tinsel and candy canes. The smell of gingerbread is in the air and the people are what publication are you writing for again, by the way? That sounds more like you're writing the brochure for the cruise line. Also, seasoned actress ain't doing a good job of pretending she's typing. Is this some kind of inside joke within the B Christmas movie genre or something? Maybe the sound of the keys was gonna interfere with the mic, but it's all dialogued voiceover anyway, so just- That doesn't sound right. None of it sounds right, girl. None of it sounds right. Start over. Quit while you're ahead. This is a shame it's gotta end though, right? What what do you mean? Well it's not like you're gonna stay on that boat forever. <laughs> Said no one ever. Yeah, this just sounds so contrived, doesn't it? That is the laziest plot convenience thing I've ever heard. Though again, I haven't seen a whole lot of these, and this movie is definitely better than some of the ones I have seen. Pam? Ship. What? It's called a ship. I do appreciate that. That was well, well established. I felt, I felt that. Boats take a lot of time and effort to make too, but ships are just a whole nother level. You know, that's why we call them ships and not boats. Just remember, more steamy, more circulation. Aw, cringe, no. Our hearts throbbing as our lips deliciously met. That's sexy. Oh, that was not sexy at all, okay? I'm pretty sure this is some rich executive's Beverly Hills mansion estate. Also, what's with the casual wear again, Mr. Cruise Director? I'm getting kind of sick of seeing you out of uniform. Close to an hour in and we've reached a scene that is so unbearable to watch. It feels like no one wanted to be there. Can we get a drink? Eggnog, peppermint, uh, a little bit. Uh... You know what? Don't tell me. Surprises. And you know within the universe those drinks cost at least eight dollars each and that's 2017 money for you. It'd probably be more like 15 with today's inflation. This scene isn't completely worthless though pertaining to the storyline at least. This drunk revealing cold feet thing is just not working. None of it is in reality. Everyone just wants their checks so they can get out of there. Jingle all the way. Oh what fun is you know these locations IRL are miles away from each other and escaping the uncomfortable house setting gives the actors a little more hope. The outer decks of the Queen Mary have always been enchanting and inspiring no matter the condition the ship has been in and it's a great relatable topic. Vivica A. Fox knows how to work with the actor she's with. I can see why people love her so much. In this scene, they are actually up on the original tennis court half deck that also acted as an extended heightened ceiling for the second class main lounge, one of the spaces mostly unaltered since her sailing days. The deck since was raised with a wedding gazebo. I get the idea, but it was cheaply constructed and an eyesore, and they appear now to be restoring the space to its original charm while still utilizing it for its post-sailing wedding venue purpose. See? We can have the best of both worlds. Jake, you aren't you on the clock, or is this your break? You warm you up. May I remind you that you are still on duty? Yeah. And if one of your higher-ups see you, you can easily get fired. Is that the going rate for saving the woman you love? <laughs> Very different scenarios, by the way, but similar principle. Work with me. La, 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 la. Someone's not so jolly. What's the matter? I just got finished reading Finding Love on a Christmas Cruise. I thought you finally wanted to spend some time together. I do. And have some fun for a change. I did. The only reason you even came on this cruise with me was to write this article for New York Minute. I feel used. How was that supposed to make me feel any better? Okay, wow, this is sudden and kind of unhinged. Becky, you're acting like you just found a photo of your best friend with your man. Like, like Jake? What? 
But that's amazing. I, I thought you were just embellishing for the story. Yeah, at first I was. I think Pam is totally in the right here. She did have fun and wow. Becky, I am so sorry. That was a quick switch. I guess one hour and 30 minutes isn't enough time for a character development. So it appears to be either day two or three on Christmas Island. I don't see no Christmas decorations anywhere, by the way. You might as well have put a fake snow filter over it. Or one of those cheap early 90s theme border things. Look, I don't know how much this cruise cost, but that cookie decorating event makes me think that this cruise line knows how to cut corners. Unless our main cast of characters put this together themselves, Otherwise, being a cruise director looks like a pretty easy job because we don't see Jake doing a whole lot of what he gets paid to do. Okay, I had to check out these selfies one by one. Look at that, the film crew. They knew these pics were gonna go by too fast for anyone to notice or care. But here I am. Unless it's a well-edited trimming of movie magic, this was one easy paycheck for the cast. I see the draw with these movies now if I didn't already before. Okay, that very well might be the same building they filmed the excruciating karaoke scene in. It may not be a house, but it also could be somewhere in the Hollywood Hills. I can't believe it's the last big night of the cruise before we head back to LA. Because, honey, you're in LA right now. Don't fool yourself. Attention, land lovers. This is your indefatigable captain speaking. Is and everyone relegated to this one spot the last night? Or is it like Pan Am or 1984, but in more of a Brave New World kind of way, where cameras and microphones span all throughout this sizable island? It's probably just for this event recorded in this cruise line's version of the Carnival Capers. No rainforest killing paper here, Jake. So scratch all of what I just said except for the dystopian world building part. Riding around in this spiffy holiday themed land vehicle. <laughs> because these cruise capital passengers are just missing the colorful wigs and makeup that make members of the capital so distinct. This movie and this universe is making a whole lot of sense now. Also, this is one thirsty Christmas cruise. Calm down just a little bit. This is the miracle tree. Because now we're suddenly getting super wholesome out of absolutely nowhere. To celebrate everything that's right in the world. Cynical wholesomeness, what a concept, huh? Cruise counter number four again, with the same stock footage of the Grand Princess class ship, because who wants to pay $80 twice when you don't have to, and all you really need is less than 10 seconds per transition. And we're back at that ugly banquet hall again. Just look at those ugly dividers in the background. I'm just saying, people who've never been on a cruise ship before, don't be deceived, okay? Cruise lines have some incredible designers. I would love to see the look on my mother's face. And the truth is, I have two more cruises after this one, and I, I'm going to be on the high seas until early January. I Can't tell if she's disappointed in him or just sad to see him go. I'm going to go get some fresh air. Excuse me. Okay. Never mind. Pam, you just asked him this. Does the B-movie side of Hollywood not understand the concept of- I live in the real world, Jake. Or something? You don't give your work a two days notice and the hospitality industry is even stricter about things like that, you know? I don't care how B-movie this is, this is so stupid. Speaking of stupid, look at the poor Queen Mary. Look at the ways they've cheapened that once glamorous Art Deco ocean liner with that 90s overhang and that cheap industrial-esque door and those ugly planters. And I get how durable and safe the industrial grade stairs are, but could you please pretty them up? Make them match the look of the quaint and charming detail of the original staircases? New management has their work cut out for them, let me tell you. This is not the real world. Yeah, neither is your attitude or your idea of what Jake is able to do. What she's explaining here is the B-movie industry in a nutshell. How many people do you know that end up happy? I don't know, I mean, I'm looking around this ship and it seems like a lot of people, a lot of people are happy. Yeah, a little too happy. You might want to give them a drug test later. Have you? talk to everyone on this boat? 
My life is not on a ship, Jake. And your life isn't working for that paper either. You've offered all of us great advice. Now, let me offer you some. Okay, despite the clumsy, cringy writing here, it's definitely a good subject matter they're bringing up. And in the perfect setting, out at sea, they're doing a good job of having an effect on me here. Haven't flushed out Pam's character enough, though. I just don't feel the oppressed, doesn't totally love her job thing. I feel like they could have hinted at it more throughout the movie because she had a lot of fun and we see her having a lot of fun. It really didn't take much to convince her to go on this trip either. Maybe while her friends were having a really good time, she was worried or sad or trying to write and it was bringing everyone down, you know? <sighs> Okay, so it began strong and it's ending pretty strong because I gotta say, the ethos this music and Vivica's acting is doing here is working on me. What is she gonna decide? What is he going to decide? You're keeping me in suspense. Also gotta say, I'm glad she's rewriting the story because, oh man. Also love that transition. But what in the convenient filming schedule are they leaving the ship at night for? That never happens. Like, they must be the priority off-boarding passengers that leave as the ship is docking into port at 5 a.m. Except that they're all doing it, and only certain passengers get that. What a lazy, sort of, but not really, picture montage sequence through Pam's cheap-looking phone. Yeah, what is her book about anyways? Is it a novel? A memoir? Also, credit where credit is due, I really do feel she's back in the daily grind as we see her in her apartment. Ending the magical cruise experience on the upper decks was a good call. They watched the love boat growing up. I'm confident of that. Oh, in no time flat, Arlo has grown up so much. And we didn't even know that about his character. I'm gonna need some time off. Yeah, great, you, you earned it. Also, she has an amazing relationship with her boss. Wow, that's special. No, I'm, I'm not going after anyone. I am finally gonna write my book. I'm gonna stop talking about it, and I'm gonna be about it. Roll credits, that's a wrap. We're good. But an hour and 20 minutes isn't long enough, baby. We need a happy ending that's also romantic. Also, I know that's not what a slate is used for. Okay, do all the main characters live in New York or something? This is the other side of the country, and we are not given any explanation as to why Paul is here other than he fell in love with Becky. Did he decide to move to New York? Is that a, a jade angelfish? <laughs> I study those for real. Yeah, it's one of the perks of working in fashion. <laughs> nice. We learned very briefly in a much earlier scene that Becky works in fashion. So that's nice and convenient for our lovable characters here, isn't it? It just makes sense for this kind of movie. And here they're doing that thing considered woke to some people where they reverse roles. The woman isn't chasing after the man and giving into him or staying stoic for him for some reason, like what we see in Affair to Remember. I don't know, I'm not complaining. Of course, they're pleasing everyone by having them both quit their jobs and the question of where are they headed with their lives now? Will Jake get a job at a New York hotel or something? He's more than qualified, we can be sure of that. Maybe it's up to the viewer to decide. I really want to know what Pam's parents do or did for a living because that place is an estate. That thing is more than just a mansion, okay? It probably has anywhere from 3 to 20 acres of land attached. That aerial shot of the random neighborhood is not the same neighborhood this house is part of, okay? Maybe they're old money. They're probably old money. They're not playing the old money aesthetic, that's for sure. They are old money. Those mashed potatoes look really sad. 
Like the ones in powder form that you add water to. Oh, I'm sorry, Pam's narrating. Now one thing that I do appreciate about her book getting published like this is that in her profession she probably has a lot of connections, so I can believe it was a little easier for her than your average person to get it published within what looks to be a matter of years in this timeline. Are we rolling credits yet? Okay, good, because this song slaps. I am putting this on my Christmas playlist. Okay, this video is probably long enough. So, and with that said, subscribe for more content like this. This Great Ships of Cinema is on the more tame side. Late January, close to the sixth year anniversary of Shane Dawson's scary three-part Queen Mary Ghost series, I will be posting a series of my own commentarying on what an insulting disaster that series was. If you don't know who Shane Dawson is, subscribe, hit that notification bell, sit back, and find out all you ever need to know. The Queen Mary is a treasure, and we need to protect her at all costs. No more wrong cruises here. In the meantime, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy New Year's, may your 2024 be full of fresh horizons, new discoveries, and the gentle assurance of hope and healing, especially with all that's going on in our world today. Stay safe, and I will see you on the next voyage.